Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, as just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are a God who is attentive to us. We're thankful, Lord, that you are sovereign Lord over all creation, and yet you hear us when we pray. You know how many hairs are on our heads. As many, uh, even as, a, as the scripture writer uh, was overwhelmed by the beauty of creation and said, who, is, who am I that you are mindful of me? Lord, we ask the same question, but we're thankful that you know us. Somehow you know the, the personal details of our lives. You know the fears uh, that weigh us down. You know the, the hurt uh, that holds us back. You know, uh, you know all of the ways that we are confused or angry or bitter and yet you love us, and we are so thankful for that. God, as we continue in this unshackled missions emphasis series, God, we pray that you would truly set us free. We're thankful that by your grace we can be set free from sin. We can be set free from the penalty of sin and forgiven. We can be set free from the power of sin and, and empowered to live lives of love and generosity. Lord, we, we are thankful that you unshackle us when we are bound or uh, we just don't know how to turn. We're thankful that you give us wisdom and grace to, to become the people that you want us to be and live the lives that you want us to live. So God, we, we pray freedom into our lives, into our relationships, into our families. Lord, help us to be uh, on fire for you. Help us to live lives of purpose and intentionality as we seek to make the name of Jesus known uh, in our lives and to the world around us. God, today we pray for all those who are on our hearts. We pray for those who are on the road traveling. We think of Faith and her group and Rusty, and uh, we pray that you would bless them, help them to know your love and uh, pour out your protection upon them. God, we pray for uh, Sally and all those who need healing today. We, we know that there are several, many here, who have uh, the burdens of diagnoses and, and uh, concerns about their health. And uh, Lord, we pray for all those who were mentioned and all those who uh, are um, still battling things in silence. We pray that your grace would be with them. God, today we thank you for the wonderful gift of new life. We thank you for Grayson. We thank you for TJ. We pray for their parents, that you would give them wisdom to raise these children to know you and love you as Savior and Lord. We pray, Lord, for parents, that you would give them strength and wisdom as, as uh, they parent and love these little children. God, we pray uh, that we would uh, always be thinking about how we can help those, as Jody shared with the children, help those who are younger, help those who are in need. We know, Lord, that when we see someone in need, we are looking into your face. And when we 
when we serve the poor, when we serve the needy, Lord, we are, we are doing that unto you. And when we withhold the help that we have the power to give, we are uh, refraining from helping you. We are uh, not helping you. And so, Lord, I pray that that word would be impressed upon our hearts today. And, Lord, help us to go out of our way to serve those who are in need. God, today we pray that you would continue to speak to us through the remaining time that we have together. Uh, set us free. Give us vision. Connect our hearts uh, with your heart for the world. Uh, God, we don't want to be selfish people or selfish families. We always want to be outwardly focused, thinking about how we can bless the world around us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to how you want to do that. Uh, Lord, speak to our hearts. Bless, our, bless the remaining time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we are thankful to have Thomas Finnegan with us, and so we welcome you, Tom. And uh, Keith Hagenbuch is going to come up and introduce Tom to us. Let's welcome Tom as he comes. For me, this is a good part. I've looked forward one day to being able to introduce Tom. Um, just thinking, you know, we sang, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and uh, Tracy knows that was my wife's favorite uh, hymn, written by Charles Wesley, a Brit. I'm a traditional German Lutheran, worshiping in a Methodist church, and I get a chance to introduce an Irish Catholic. <laughs> it is true, we are all one in Christ, Amen. and I'm thankful to introduce Tom. We met uh, at least a couple of years ago. He was a candidate in uh, one of the Carrick's weekends, and I was a worker, I don't remember what my place was, but we kind of bonded, became friends, and um, it's been such a blessing to keep communicating with him since he's been released. He committed to helping um, parolees um, when he was finally released, and he is doing that. And so it's a tremendous pleasure for me to introduce Thomas Francis Joseph Finnegan. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the reason I came here today, I mean, those of you who don't know, I, I'm, I live in Syracuse. And Keith called me up and said, can you come to Finley Lake? And I was like, sure. And then I looked it up on the map. I thought I was going to Cleveland. <laughs> um, and he invited me to come out last night, and I said, no, I can't. I'm a Syracuse University graduate and a season ticket holder for football, and we had played, we have to play Clemson last night. So I went to that game and wished I hadn't, but um, I drove up here this morning, and, and the whole way up here, I just was thinking about Keith and, and about my, my big friend over here, who would... These guys are heroes, and you guys need to know that. These guys are heroes for me. Where'd this thing go? Um, my, my, my voice is big enough, I don't really need this. But, um, and that when they asked me to come here, I would have gone to California to do it, because these guys are absolutely amazing. These guys saved my life in, in many ways. And, Probably the way I should start is just tell you a little bit about me. I'm, uh, as Keith said, I'm, a, I'm a, from a very old Irish Catholic family. Four generations, 100% Irish. But I grew up one of eight children in a very affluent community in central New York, Skinny Atlas, in case anybody knows the area. Um, went to school, got my master's degree, went to work, and thought I had a plan, thought I was going to make myself successful. And for many years, I did. Um, 2001, after a number of years in different industries, I became the CEO of an aerospace technology company in uh, eastern New York. And I traveled all over the world, visiting customers, taking care of problems, fixing issues, and 
thought I was the king of the world. Um, became very successful, made a lot of money, and thought, I, had, I got this, I don't need anything. I don't need anybody. I don't need God. I don't need anything. Ha ha. Um, as you all know, if you don't know, you'll find out that uh, all you have to do to make God laugh is tell him that you have a plan. And you'll find out quickly that that's not the case. So things were going well. I, had, I got married, four kids, two boys, two girls. Life was grand. Then my life started to fall apart. My wife and I divorced. Um, probably my fault because I was gone all the time, traveling. More worried about making the almighty dollar than worried about having a relationship. I was married for 22 years. Um, I own the fact that that didn't work. But I, I buried myself in more work and continued to be successful on the outside. Inside, I was a hollow shell, always looking, always wondering, not knowing what I needed, but still thinking it was going to come from me. So 2008, economy crashes, worst economy in the world. Everyone's losing money. Business goes, goes down. Me living this incredibly high lifestyle, I make some stupid mistakes. I, I steal from my company. I misappropriate funds, as they say, to, to maintain my lifestyle, to do the things that I wanted to do, impervious to the world around us. And because I was the CEO, nobody knew, and you know I got away with it for a while, until the company was going to be bought by a Japanese organization, and they hired forensic accountants to come in. And guess what? They find out pretty quick. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm confronted with this, and I own it, which was really hard. I accept it, and I'm willing to face the consequences of my actions. Because of what I was doing, because of my job, they wanted me to just pay the money back, which I, I decided, I, I mean, not decided, I was asked to do and, and did. Um, but because this was a time that under different circumstances, I, that would have been the end of it, and maybe I would have got a slap on the wrist. But at that time in the world around us, there was a situation going on in New York City with a guy named Bernie Madoff who may or may not have, you may or may not have heard of this guy, but he had stolen $150 billion from his clients. So it suddenly became a very chic thing to prosecute white collar criminals. Again, I was guilty, don't kid yourself. I, I was absolutely guilty. But I had an overzealous prosecutor who really wanted to make an example out of me. He called me all kinds of names. And they couldn't prosecute me because my company wasn't willing to, so they got me on the Al Capone defense, or a, a, a prosecution, I guess that's the right way of saying it. They charged me with filing a false instrument for filing my tax returns for three straight years without claiming the money that I had taken, because once you take the money, whether it's a crime or real, you have to claim it on your income. Funny how those criminals never filed income taxes. but. Um, so I was, and I was absolutely guilty of it. You know, I, I didn't file. So they, they charged me with filing a false instrument, and then they charged me with grand larceny for cashing my tax refund checks because I wasn't entitled to those cash refund checks. So I got prosecuted. I accepted guilt. I pled guilty without a trial. And they sentenced me to three to nine years in prison for that. First time I'd ever been in trouble in my life, but didn't matter. It was a chic thing to do to prosecute white, white collar criminals. And again, I'm not making an excuse because that, again, I'm, I'm guilty. So I went to prison. I went to a nice little place called Groveland out near Rochester. It was a, basically a work camp. 
after 30 days of, of being there, I was in a work release program and I went to work every day, came home at night and did, you know, did my time. All the time, my lawyer was filing an appeal, claiming malicious prosecution and all this other stuff. And finally, in 2014, I was released um, on an appeal, the, the circuit court and the fourth department of Western New York's uh, Supreme Court released me saying that I had been prosecuted maliciously and should never have had to deal with that kind of a crime or that kind of a penalty for the crime I committed, especially since I had made restitution. Well, they let me out, but they still had the three to nine, so I had done, I had done three years. I still had nine years of parole or whatever, or six years of parole to deal with. And I had a very upset local prosecutor who was made to be embarrassed because the, the court overruled them saying that they had maliciously prosecuted me. So they came after me with everything they got. And I was out on the street for, from 2014 until 2016. And again, I was, went back to work, I was doing my thing. And my life began to crumble again because I was under the gun of these people constantly chasing me around, giving me grief. And I had a couple other life-changing events in my life. Um, July 3rd, 2015, my older brother passed away suddenly. Uh, he's two years older than me. And that was kind of dramatic, but infinitely worse. August 3rd, 2015, my youngest son was killed in a DWI accident. He was hit by a, a young 25-year-old female in Las Vegas. He was in Las Vegas, that's where he lived and worked. And she was drunk on her phone, driving a car. She, she ran my son over and killed him. So guess what, I get real angry, real I'm mad at the world now. I'm mad at everything, everybody, especially God. How could you do this to me? Um, so I started, you know, misbehaving again and played right into the hands of my prosecutors. And so they grabbed me up again. I, they, they got me on a parole violation for breaking curfew because I didn't care anymore. I was not going to follow the rules. I wasn't going to do what I was supposed to do. So I started breaking curfew. I started traveling without my travel permits. I started doing all, I mean, when I say I started acting out, I didn't commit more crimes. I violated my parole conditions. I said to all those people, the heck with you, I'm going to do what I want to do. This, I don't care anymore. So, 2016, they brought me back into the system and sentenced me to another 18 months of fun. And they put me in Elmira, which, thank God most of you, hopefully none of you know anything about Elmira, but that is like a horrible place. And they put me in a eight by 12 cage for 31 days and you, never, you get out one hour a day, and it's a, absolutely the worst place you could ever be. And you know, you talk about finding your bottom or hitting your bottom, I found my bottom. When the only book I had was a Bible, the only thing I had to read was scripture, the only person I could talk to was myself, and I was in pain, I was hurting, and I, prayed and prayed and prayed to God to find, you know, help me find some way to fix this, some way to get out of this, some way to manipulate it. You know, I wasn't ready to turn my will and my life over yet. I was looking for a favor. But the favor came in the form of sending me to the second worst place in the world, which was Gowanda, which is Again, fortunately, you never have to worry about that, but that is the worst place in the world 
for, except for a max, of course. It's just a horrible place where the, the guards are just vicious and they make your life a living hell. Not for the civilians, though, only for us. To the civilians in the outside world, to visitors, they sweet and innocent and smile a lot. To us, they're, they're horrible. But anyway, um, when I got there, God pointed me in the direction of two things. One, there was a wonderful deacon there, Deacon Hens, who immediately took me under his wing, and I started working with him. I became his, his uh, associate or his helper, whatever you want to call me and took over the, the, in charge of all the Catholic service things. But equally important, I met this incredible group of people called Kirex, which at first I didn't know what it was. And I walked in there and I met these wonderful people. I met this old guy named Keith, who immediately I bonded with. I, I met this guy, Brian, who looked like a mountain, but he cried all the time. He never stopped crying. I go, how is this guy just like, this guy can't cry. He's a, he's a... And he was, he was absolutely amazing. And I started, I started with a weekend. I started with coming, and, and the fellowship of this group was just incredible. And because they came every Friday night, it was like that one ray of sunshine in this incredible hole that we were in that brought us this awesome gift of Wow, the real world out there is, is, is still there, and, and God is a wonderful person to give us this gift, and I feel blessed. And I started to more and more get into the fellowship, you know, and, and Keith was m one of the many people that I talked to, Brian, even Chuck. Where'd Chuck go? He's, Chuck must be somewhere else. Oh, there he is back there. Chuck. And, and this amazing dynamic group of maybe 25 people just taught me some incredible life lessons about what's really important. And I committed myself there and then at that first weekend to be a different person, to turn my will and my life over to God, to make my life more of a giving than taking to make my, you know, the world around me a better place. And while I was there, I did a lot. You know, the guys will tell you that I, you know, I, I, I actually took over a lot of the mentoring of the, of the prisoners that were there, the inmates. I started helping them even while we were inside. And then I made a commitment that when I got out, I was going to do something different. So... After my 18 months, I still had three and a half years of parole to deal with, but I was a different man when I got out, and I decided I was going to find a different path. So I had the opportunity to go back to my work. Um, my company loved me. My company wanted me to be there. My company had forgiven me, but I hadn't forgiven myself, and I was still, you know, I knew I needed to go a different way. I needed to find a path that God wanted for me, not what I wanted for me. So I decided I was going to open up a fellowship for inmates as they come out, parolees. So when they come out, I help them find a job. I help them get a place to live besides the shelters that they put them in. Um, I helped them, you know, I, I can't tell you how many cell phones I bought in the last year for these inmates that are just like me, except maybe not as fortunate um, financially. But what I do today is I, I run a group of um, inmates and fellow um, Supportive group from the outside, very similar to Kirex. Catholic Charities is the, is the support group for it. And we meet every week with guys, and we help them. We, we counsel with them. We work with them. We support them. We give them whatever we can. We don't let them take advantage of us. You know, we don't give them money. We don't, you know, do anything like that. But we help them if they're willing to accept it and they're willing to work to do something right for themselves. 
And that in itself is an amazing gift to do something, to pay it forward to others. And to be able to provide a service to people that need it. To be able to provide a, a, um, a, you know, a vehicle to take what we got from the inside, what we got from guys like Brian. Stop crying over there, you're killing me. Um, <laughs> what we got from guys like Keith, from, from you know, Chuck, and the rest of the group, they're just so powerful because when they come in there on that Friday night and we sit and for two hours on that Friday night, we as the inmate feel like we're out here with you. We feel like there's life out there. We feel like there's hope. There's an opportunity. And that, that gets you through the rest of the week because the rest of the week is pure unadulterated hell, if you don't mind my saying that, because it's just, it's just not a good place. And, you know, I feel so grateful for the gifts that I was given as a result of that, that I have really dedicated the rest of my life to doing something to pay it forward. So in addition to what I do um, with, this, with this Catholic Charities group, I also meet with and, and travel, you know, let me step, half step back. Parole saw what I was doing when I got out the second time, and after, after a few short months they said, you're good, goodbye, I don't need you, any, you know, you don't have to be here anymore. So there's God working right there, because I was supposed to be under the guise of, under the uh, control of parole until June 6th of 2022. Guess what? It's still 2019 and I'm free to do anything I want to do now because God's, God's given me a path to follow. God's given me an opportunity to do it. So what I do now is I travel all over the place helping inmates release you know, parolees, I call them whatever you want to call them. Um, guys that are looking for a second chance, because you know what? Behind those walls, there's a lot of people like me. They're not all these horrible, nasty, you know, murders, rapists, killers, whatever you want to call them. There's a lot of guys like me who, you know what, are no different than any of you, except they made a mistake, one mistake in their life. You know? I think of the news right now, there, there's, you know, the, the whole college scandal, you know, this Felicity Huffman, she's going to prison for 14 days, whoopee, but she's going to prison. She made a mistake. She owned it. She accepted it. She's going to prison. She did it. She's, she's, she's accepted it. But there's a lot of people that don't make the news that go to prison. I can't tell you, within the, within the confines of prison, there's doctors. There's lawyers. There's, there's all kinds of professionals. There's, you know, I have my MBA and a couple of other advanced degrees. I was in prison. They're not just these lowly, you know, down on their luck people. And there's a lot of great people in prison. And they made a mistake. They're paying that mistake, and they're going to get out and move, you know, move their life forward. And the gifts that you're still doing it. The gifts that they, do, that they get from this group, Kirex, the gifts they get from you people with your prayers, even when you pray those, when those weekends are around, or if you come to the fence, that's a pretty amazing experience too, by the way, if, like, if any of you have ever done it. When we are allowed to come out to the outside fence and uh, you know, cross, the, cross the barbed wire is, is all these wonderful people there and we're exchanging songs and singing and talking. What a, what a blessing that is. That, that's like, you, there's not a dry eye in the house for that you know, hour or whatever that lasts. And I got to experience that a couple of times. And I get to experience it for the first time from the other side of the fence this October. So how great is that? Um, so for me, I mean, I've dedicated my life going forward to doing this type of work because... It's, it's what God's called me to do. It's what I've been asked to do. It's, it's my way of paying it forward. Giving the gifts that you know, I've been given through the, you know, the, the spiritual power, the 
amazing gifts. This guy right here, I can't even look at him. He kills me because he's, he's such an amazing man. And he's such a humble man. And, you know, I, I love the guy to death. He was one of the reasons that I got through my time incarcerated. Because I got to look forward to seeing Keith every Friday. And we'd look at each other, we'd start smiling, laugh, we'd share a joke, we'd have a good time. And for two hours, I was just a normal guy. The other thing I don't ever do anymore, although Keith honored me today, is I won't wear green anymore because that's what you wear in prison. So I, I took, and I'm Irish, <laughs> so I will put on a green shamrock at, at St. Patrick's Day, but otherwise, forget it, I get the creeps. You know, today, driving down here, I drove down here this morning, I drove by the exit for, you know, go on, and I start shaking. I physically start feeling myself getting ill, like, oh my God, what a place, get me out of here. I wanted to turn around and go home. But because I knew Keith was here, I knew Brian was here, I knew Chuck was here, I knew guys were going to be here, I would have driven to California to talk, to share what these guys have given me is, is something beyond what you could possibly imagine. Because they are a true gift from God. And if you don't believe it, I'm the, I'm the living testimony of it. Because I have changed my life dramatically as a result of them and they are a gift. And anything you can do to help them or support them is, is just terrific. You know, I heard Brian ask to come up and, you know, come, and, come, and, come to the fence. Come to do whatever. It's, it's, you know, we're not horrible people. We're not these, you know, we're not, you know, the devil incarnate here. We're, we're people just like you. You know, I, I sometimes talk to groups and they'll say, well, I'm not like you. Like, really? You ever bounced a check? You ever sped more than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit? Have you ever done, you know, anything? Guess what? If they wanted to, that's a felony. They could convict you and throw you in jail. And you could be just like me. And you know what? The people out there that don't want to forgive me or don't want to forgive us and want to judge, I can't do anything about that. You know, there's people that I grew up with, people I know that, oh, I can't talk to you. You're a convicted felon. Yeah, I am. I'm no different than I used to be, except in a positive way. And if you choose not to want to engage with me, you're lost. I'm okay with that. Guess what? There's a lot of other people out there that I can talk to, a lot of other people that I'll make friends with. There's a lot of other Keiths and Bryants and Chucks and everybody else that are going to be out there that... These guys are lifelong friends of mine. Every night before I go to bed, I, I say prayers. And every single night after I get past my kids and a few other, you know, my father's still around and, you know, some of my other relatives and friends, I talk Kyrex. And I even pray for you every night. By name. Because of all... This guy, this guy was the rector at one of my... One, actually one of the ones that I was a senior uh, steward at. And we had a chance to sit down at a small group table and share, and we cried. We cried, we shared, and those are, those are treasures that you can, never, you can never have unless you've experienced that, something like that. But... Um, I just want to, you know, I, I want to kind of close this. I don't want to talk too long, but I just want to tell you that, you know, God is good. God has been a gift to me. These guys have been a gift to me, and I'm eternally grateful for it. So today, you know, in addition to this work that I do um, to support the, the, you know, the, the released inmates, I do have a job. You know, I have a real job. Um, and believe it or not, I work with lawyers every day. I run, I, you know, I, when I went to, when I went to um, got my MBA at Syracuse, I, I became friends with a guy who was, at, he was going to law school. And after we parted ways and went our own different careers, 
he went and be, developed a very successful business. Uh, not only a law practice, but also a, a, a practice to help support lawyers who, who support people our age, most of us, state planning, elder law, you know, assisting people planning their lives. And when he found out that I was available after I got out in 2016, he calls me up and says, I want you to come and run my business. I'm like, what? He goes, yes. I says, I, he says, I know you. I know who you are. I know your character. I know you got to, you know, what happened to you. I want you to come and run my business. Guess what? God's talking there again. God gave me the opportunity to take a job where I, as Keith says, I travel all over the country teaching lawyers how to run a business, how to do their job, what they need to do to help people. And it gives me an opportunity to speak. As you can tell, I'm okay speaking in front of people. You know, I'm not, I don't want to stand behind a podium. I like to walk around and move because that's what I do. I, I get to teach. I get to coach. I get to mentor um, lawyers. And it's another way that I can, because I see what the work they do when I help them. And it's another way I get to pay things forward, helping people as I, as I go. But it gives me the freedom to do this, to come here and do this kind of work, knowing that tomorrow I can just stay home because I work out of my home if I'm not traveling. So I don't have to worry about, you know, doing too much tomorrow. I have a nice day off. Um, and these little gifts that I get, I look, at, I look at God and I say thank you every day, every day, because he's given me a blessing that I can never repay. And this is why when Keith called me and said, would you come here? I said yes without even thinking about it. I didn't even know where I was going when he said yet, when he asked me. And then I, I said, I looked at the map and said, where in the hell are you going? Where, do I, where, where is this place? Um, but I would do it again. I will do it again. I'm going to go do the Kirex weekend in October up in Gowanda. That's going to be hard, I can tell you. But that's going to be really hard to go near that wall and look at that place. Because I, when I was there, I was outside, I was working outside, so I got to leave the facility every day to go to work, but still, that's going to be hard, because that, that place is just, oof. So, God's calling me to go back there, I'm going, I'm going to be there, and I, I can't wait, but um, I guess in closure, I'll say to you, thank you for listening to me. The, the cool part about your title was Unshackled. I feel unshackled in more ways than one. You have no idea what it's like to have your arms and your legs shackled for 12 to 18 hours, not being able to move. Now that's an experience I wouldn't wish on anybody. Because the guards could care less if you don't like it. They have no empathy or sympathy for you whatsoever. So when I heard that unshackled, I said, wow, I'm unshackled in so many ways. I like to kind of move around. My feet, my arms, everything works, but it's a gift to be here for me today. It's a gift to share, and I, I really appreciate your patience to listen, your indulgence. Um, I guess I'm going to take you up on that idea of a prayer. I get it, I, I'll ask each of you to bow your heads and pray with me. As I close this, I just want to say thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come here today for the opportunity to share a little bit about who I am, my fellowship with my brothers and sisters, my ability to get up here and talk and just, with your grace, with your support, with your words, share a little bit about what we do and how we do it and why we do it. I ask for your grace to continue to do it, I ask for your blessing on all my Kirex brothers and sisters, that their work continues so they can touch the heart of inmates like me and have the gift of many more celebrations of freedom, celebrations of life, a second chance, forgiveness. What a gift. 
Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing your story. And uh, we hear the gratitude. We hear, uh, we, we heard how you, life is a gift, grace is a gift, and now you want to share that with others. Throughout this mission's emphasis, we've been saying that, um, and I've even said, and he said it several times, that the Christian life, the, 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 the Christian faith is the greatest pay it forward movement this world has ever known. And it's all about experiencing the grace and the love of Jesus for ourselves, being transformed by it, and then going to share that with the world. And that's what missions is. Missions is about, is about experiencing the grace of God and then saying, this is too good for me to keep to myself. I have to go share with others how they can know forgiveness through Christ, how they can have peace with God through Christ, how they can know, know God the way I know God. And uh, at, throughout this mission's emphasis, that's what we want to do is connect with the heart of Jesus for the world around us. It needs to hear the good news. And um, my, as we uh, close in worship this morning, my, my prayer for us is that we would be on the receiving and the giving end of the grace of Jesus. And maybe there's somebody here who behind, you know, behind the exterior, maybe you feel like you're hitting rock bottom. Maybe you have bitterness or anger because of a loss of a loved one. Maybe you're facing shame or guilt or feeling shackled. Jesus wants to set you free, and he wants you to be a recipient of his grace today. And then for those of us who have experienced the grace, we all need grace on a daily basis, but we also recognize that we're called to be sharers of this grace. We're called to be distributors of the blessings we've received and that's what the Christian life is. That's what growth is. It's about becoming a recipient of the mission. It's about receiving grace and saying, Lord Jesus, I do need help. I need your forgiveness. I need your sacrificial death to cover my sin and to set me free. And when we've received that, then we share that with the world. And so maybe this morning as we close, you need to receive the grace of Jesus to forgive you, to set you free, to, sh to shine light into your world. Or maybe God is calling you to step out of your comfort zone and to uh, serve in a new way, to share the love of Christ with a coworker or a, a classmate in, in a new way, uh, to bring your Bible to school, kids. That's, that day is coming up soon, to bring your Bible to school and to, to make a stand, to say, I'm a follower of Christ, and I want to share him with the world. But um, let's receive the grace of Jesus so we can share the grace of Jesus this week. Let's stand. I'd invite the ushers to come forward. Um, we can offer our gifts to the Lord and also offer our hearts uh, and voices to the Lord as well. Let's stand and sing. Those who the sun sets free are free indeed. And Jesus is continuing this work of unshackling his people so that we can be set free from sin and shame and set free from fear to go out and love this world. Uh, our world is desperate for a savior, and we know that we know him, and we are called to share him. Um, as we go from this place, uh, before you go, if anybody wants just prayer, if you just want to come up, you're feeling shackled to something, maybe it's bitterness or fear or anger or sin, um, I invite you to come up. I'll, I'll um, share the benediction, and then if you are just feeling shackled and anything is, is bothering you or burdening you, uh, I invite you to come up and pray. But stick around for hospitality time. We have coffee and treats over there. Thank you so much for coming to worship. As you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Come for prayer if the Spirit's nudging you.